So this will be a pretty quick talk on the antifungals. There's not a lot of fungal diseases that you need to know for the USMLE, and there's not a whole lot of uh, antifungal drugs in general that are used routinely. So uh, the antifungals we're going to go over are ergosterol inhibitors, which include azoles, polyenes, and allylamines. We're going to talk about echinocandins, and then flucytosine is another antifungal drug, uh, but we're not going to spend any time talking about that. But if you want to do your own research, you can feel free. I just don't see that one coming up that often. Okay, so what is an ergosterol inhibitor? Well, what is ergosterol? Ergosterol is basically cholesterol for fungus. So as you know, we have cholesterol in our cells, which stabilize the cell membrane. It's the same thing for fungus, but they have ergosterol. So if you can inhibit the production of ergosterol or the function of ergosterol in any way, then you can indeed uh, cause fungal death. So the three classes of ergosterol inhibitors are azoles, polyenes, and allylamines. Okay, so these are the, uh, the drugs that, uh, this, this isn't a comprehensive list of drugs, these are just the most common to come up. And the ones that are in blue are topical, the ones that are in red are systemic, so oral or IV, and the ones that are in purple can be either. So we have clotrimazole and ketoconazole, uh, fluconazole, itraconazole, posaconazole, voriconazole, and then the polyenes we have nystatin, which nystatin is a swish and swallow, so you might think that that's oral, but nystatin is not at all absorbed, so it really is topical. Amphotericin B, and uh, the, out of the L means we have terbinafine. So the azole antifungal, so we're talking about this first group here, clotrimazole through voriconazole. This, uh, these are probably the most widely prescribed antifungals, and they have a really broad spectrum, and it includes candida, which is the most common fungal disease that gets treatment in the United States, and it also is effective against the fungal lung diseases, like histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, and coccidiomycosis. So for skin infections, uh, the, you can use topical, but uh, as far as tinea capitis or internal infections, then you need to use one of the systemic agents. So if a patient has, uh, if a patient just has athlete's foot, you can use clotrimazole. If a patient has candidal vaginitis, uh, you can use ketoconazole. But if a patient has tinea capitis, then you need to use something like itraconazole or uh, uh, if a patient has uh, a disseminated candidemia, then you're going to need to use uh, a, an IV form. So all of these drugs are pregnancy class C, with the exception of voriconazole. So if a woman is pregnant, you really need to weigh the risks of whether or not you want to use this drug or not. There's actually really only one, uh, two drugs that are... Uh, pregnancy class B out of the antifungals, which are amphotericin B and terbinafine. Uh, okay, so itraconazole is a suitable treatment for the dermatophytoses, uh, and so that would be like uh, tinea capitis, tinea cruris, uh, tinea pedis, athlete's foot, and it's also uh, used for onychomycosis, which is uh, when you get the, the fungal infection underneath the nail. Fluconazole is the treatment of choice for cryptococcal meningitis, and the reason for this is because it's got a great penetration into the cerebral spinal fluid, and that's that unique out of the other antifungals, of the other azole antifungals. So, so fluconazole is used as treatment for cryptococcal meningitis, and it's also used as prophylaxis. Voriconazole is used as treatment uh, for invasive aspergillosis. So those are three unique uses of, uh, of specific azole antifungals. Otherwise, you just need to know when you use topical, which is skin infections, and when you use systemic, which is tinea capitis and internal infections. 
So the polyenes, what they do is they bind ergosterol, and so by binding ergosterol, they basically poke holes in the fungal cell membrane. So amphotericin B is something we want to avoid, and that's because the adverse effects are significant. I should note that with the azoles, the, uh, the adverse effects are primarily anaphylaxis and cytochrome P450 inhibition. And so in general, if the, if the patient uh, doesn't show any allergic symptoms or they aren't on a lot of drugs, then it, we're usually not concerned. With amphotericin B, on the other hand, there's notable hepatotoxicity and nephrotoxicity, and that accumulates over time. So the longer they're on amphotericin B, the worse it is. There's new formulations of amphotericin B called liposomal amphotericin B, which reduce some of these adverse effects, but they're still there. So we try not to get patients on this drug if we can avoid it. So generally, amphotericin B is going to be used in patients with life-threatening mycoses, and it does have a wide spectrum, and it is very strong and very effective, but like I said, because of the adverse effects, we try not to use it. So when you see amphotericin B, or when you're going to prescribe amphoter amphotericin B, is in life-threatening cases of fungal pneumonia, Patients with mucormycosis, which is a fungal infection of the respiratory tract, particularly the upper respiratory tract. Patients that have cryptococcal meningitis and, uh, and patients with disseminated infections. Note that fluconazole is our drug of choice for cryptococcal meningitis, but in patients that have refractory cryptococcal meningitis, then we go ahead and prescribe amphotericin B. Another one of the polyenes, and this works the same way as amphotericin B, but it's not absorbed, so it doesn't have nearly the, it doesn't have any of the problems that amphotericin B has as far as side effects, is nystatin. And you've heard this drug before. This drug is a swish and swallow, and it's used very frequently for oroesophageal thrush. So oroesophageal thrush can happen if you're on an antibiotic, and all of a sudden you get a candido infection of your mouth or of your esophagus. And this is common in children. Uh, nystatin is also used as a ointment for vaginal candidiasis and for intertrigonous candidal infections. So it's used topically. Remember, swish and swallow is still topical because it's not being absorbed. And in general, nystatin is very well tolerated. So remember nystatin, particularly with the orosophageal thrush and with vaginal candidiasis. So the allylamines, we have terbinafine, and terbinafine is an oral drug, and it's administered primarily for the treatment of onychomycosis. Now, the reason that we like to use terbinafine in onychomycosis is because it actually has been shown to be superior to itraconazole, and it doesn't have quite the same side effects or drug interactions as itraconazole does. So if we can use terbinafine, we prefer to use terbinafine. Uh, the adverse effects are primarily mild GI upset, and, uh, and, and so this should be your, your treatment of choice if you're presented with this for onychomycosis. Otherwise, itraconazole is fine, but this is, this is probably the, this, this would be the best. So here's the echinocandins. We have capsofungin, mycofungin, and idulofungin. Now, the echinocandins block beta-glucan synthase, and this is an enzyme necessary for cell wall formation. And all of these are IV, and they're well tolerated. And these are used for esophageal candidiasis, more severe esophageal candidiasis, invasive candidiasis, and candidemia. So this is kind of your middle-of-the-road uh, antifungal. If we can't use our azoles if, if they're not if if the disease is not responding to the azoles, uh, but we want to avoid amphotericin B. Echinocandins are sort of our second line of choice. So severe esophageal candidiasis, I should say, that's not responsive to uh, azoles or nystatin, invasive candidiasis, and candidemia if we want to avoid using amphotericin B, which we usually do want to avoid using amphotericin B. Echinocandins are 
in general well tolerated and they are also pregnancy class C.